I love this, that, that God's command on our life is to seek first and then all will be added. And I think sometimes our struggle in faith is that we, we do it backward. We, we try to add everything and then maybe seek first the kingdom, maybe second the kingdom. And, and God's promise for followers of Jesus is that when we seek first the kingdom of God, that God will bring about the things of heaven on earth. Can I tell you, the goal of your Christian faith is not for you to go to heaven, but the goal of your faith is to bring heaven to earth that we would be the kind of people that live our lives in such a way that we do not bring hell into the circumstances that we face. Church, can I tell you, the world does a great job of bringing hell on earth. But when we become people of God, we get to bring down, Jesus said that my kingdom would come to earth on earth as in heaven. And that is the beauty and the calling that God has given us. And so can in this moment, can we just celebrate that God has asked us to seek his kingdom first? And then everything else will be added to your life as you follow him all the days of your life. So good. So good. Hey, I got a couple of things before we begin our, our message today. And uh, first of all, I want to welcome everybody joining us online. Everybody welcome us in room for the first time today. I want to welcome our Ironton campus as well. So pumped for how God is working there. Um, uh, they can understand the struggle. I know some of you um, are asking, what's... What's with the, the bucket out front, the big uh, backhoe out front? And, uh, and I just need to share with you that we're just trying to build a God-sized baptismal for the vision that he has given us in the next five years. I believe it's God's goal that we would baptize the entire community that surrounds us, the entire community of Ironton, and eventually the whole state of Ohio. I love that y'all just laugh at that vision. Like, <laughs> that's funny, Pastor Brad. We're just going to baptize the whole state of Ohio. You know we will. Really, we're building parking spots, but it's the same concept. We need 48 new parking spots to accommodate, to accommodate the growth that is taking place at Behoath Church. I just look around for just a second. Uh, people stop coming to church if they don't have a place to park. And so uh, we want to make sure that we create a space for people uh, can come and park and to join us for worship. And I would just say this, uh, if you look around today, uh, there is, there's a little bit of room, but not a lot of room. And so if you're an 11 a.m. or most of your life, I would encourage you to come to 9 a.m. Or best yet, come on Saturday night at 5.30. That's where you get the real deal. That's where you get the unscripted, raw version of the message. It's really the best version, in my opinion. And, um, and so we'd encourage you to make space for new people coming in today. Can we celebrate that God is moving in so many ways? All right, today we're going to finish our series, We Move Forward. We Move Forward. It is the sixth installment of this series, and we've been wrestling with six questions that can change our lives. And so uh, can we just take a moment and thank Pastor Connor for last weekend's message, that he would preach God's word with passion and conviction, and he gave us a good word last weekend. But we're going to begin our time together doing what we've done every week together, which is to proclaim our scripture year verse over our lives. Come on, let's say it now. Everybody, wherever you're watching from, wherever you're standing, right now, let's say it together. Forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. All right, let's proclaim our vision today. We are people of courage. When the natural tendency is to play it safe, we move forward. Believing God is doing a new thing and relentlessly pursuing the advancement of the kingdom of God and becoming champions who passionately live out our purpose. Today, I want to I wanna focus on this idea of what does it mean to advance the kingdom of God? Of God. I'm convinced that in our lives, this is the one thing that God has given us to do, is to advance his kingdom. And so we're going to spend time talking about what does that look like. I'm going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 23. If you've got a Bible, open it. Uh, we believe in God's word, church. We believe in what it says. We believe in what it can do in our lives. 2 Samuel chapter 23, looking at the life of David one last week. Here we go. This is what it says in verse 13. During the harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rapham. 
at the time David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was there, they were there at Bethlehem. And David longed for a water and said, oh my goodness, that somebody would get me a drink of water near the well at the gate of Bethlehem. So three mighty special forces guys broke through the Philistine lines, drew some water near the well at the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord and he said, far be it from me, Lord, to do this. He said, is it not the blood of the men who went at risk their lives? Why would I do this? Why would I drink it? Such were the exploits of these three mighty warriors, three mighty warriors. Uh, I want to tell you that this message today probably will not be the most inspiring message in this series, but I want you to know that it is the most important. It is the one that I'm most passionate about. It's the one that I believe can change your life. And my concern for us is this. It is not the lack of faith, but it is the loneliness within our faith. Church, sometimes I hear people say, I don't feel connected. I don't feel connected. I'm going to say it one last time. You choose your own level of connection within the church. And often people who don't feel connected are asking the wrong questions. They're asking, what's next? What's next for me? What do you got, Pastor Brad, for me today? But I find that people who are most connected to the church and most connected to God's mission are the people who are asking, who's next? Who's next? And so the last question that I want us to wrestle with in this series is, yo, who are you taking with you? Who will you take with you? Church, turn to your neighbor for just a second. Turn to them now and ask, who are you taking with you? Who are you taking with you? Who are you taking with you? Come on, let's pray in this moment as we begin this time. God, we are grateful, grateful for this word that you have given us today. I pray that we would begin to see that the that the level of our faith and the level of our lives and the calling that you have put upon us is not solely about what we accomplish in this world, but it's who others become because we give our lives to them. God, this is our prayer today, that we would take them with us, take them with us, and we would leave here changed, ready for the work that you have. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen, amen. Elbow somebody next to you in the ribs and say, take them with you, take them with you. <laughs> Take them with you. Jab them. Keep them awake. Make sure it hurts. Take them with you. <laughs> so good. Take them with you. Uh, I, am, I am aging. I know some of you already know that, but I am aging. And I've come to the realization in my life that uh, I have a good four to five years with my, with my kids. I, I cannot believe that I have kids who are almost ready for college. I know you're like, Pastor Brad, that's four years away. No, four years goes, it goes quick when you're raising kids. You know this, right? And, uh, and so as I've been thinking about them leaving and getting ready for college, I've decided over this last year that often when I'm going to the store or to Lowe's or to wash in the car or going on a hike or riding a bike or going fit, whatever I'm doing, I will just open the basement door or I'll yell up the stairs. Anybody want to go? <laughs> typically not the response that I get. <laughs> a lot of times, church, it is dead silent. <laughs> Anybody want to go? Dead silent. And uh, my kids are voraciously studying for their education, which is why they do not respond. And maybe some video games in there, but <laughs> often I'll get this response, where are you going, dad? And, um, and sometimes they don't mean to hurt my feelings, and they don't hurt my feelings. Just make me sad because they're like, "Now nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I, I don't want to go. And, uh, and I'm at this point where I realized that I really love taking them with me. But how many of you know if you have raised kids in your life, you have not always been in the season of parenting where you've enjoyed taking them with you? Can I get an amen, parents? Kids, I know you think you're perfect, but <laughs> wait till you become a parent. <laughs> There have been seasons in my life of raising kids where it was easier to do it by myself. It was easier to go alone. Uh, my youngest, Miles, man, this kid, when he, when he was just a baby, he would screech like a parrot if he got excited about something. 
And so we would go to the grocery and he would see a box of cereal and he would just screech at the top of his lungs. I mean, have you ever been in the grocery when a kid is crying so loud that you want to leave the grocery? This is my kid. He would be yelling at the top of his lungs, not because he was mad, just because he was excited. And sometimes I would, I just felt like leaving him in the aisle, walking around the other aisle, and then coming back being like, yo, whose kid's that? <laughs> Somebody get this kid. Uh, my other little guy, when he was little, he got so focused on, on building this go-kart. Church, I don't know anything about mechanics. I know about carpentry. And so sometimes he would go with me to Lowe's, and I just needed a few two-by-fours. But he would stand there in Lowe's like Rain Man, just naming off everything that he would need, every bolt, every belt, every chain, everything that we went by, every piece of metal. He's like, Dad, we need this for the amount of torque that we need for the engine horsepower, and I have no clue what I'm saying right now, but he did. And what was meant to be like a, a, a 30 minute trip would take us two hours long. And sometimes Janelle, just cause she needed a break would say, hey love, would you take him with you? <laughs> and in that phase of my life, I was like, it is easier for me to do this alone. How many of you know that sometimes in your life, it is easier for you to do it alone than it is to take somebody with you? It is easier for you to solve that equation than it is for you to teach them how to solve that equation. It is easier for you to clean the house than it is for you to beg them to get off the couch. <laughs> it is easier for you to go to a movie by yourself than it is to have somebody next to you asking questions the entire time that have nothing to do with the plot. And you're like, would you just please shut up? <laughs> How many of you have people who talk to you during movies? My goodness, like, this is why you go alone. <laughs> Sometimes in life, it is easier to do it on our own. And if I could just make it plain for you today, church, what we're really saying, what makes it easy is that you're not being inconvenienced. Are you with me on this? What makes it easy is that you're not inconvenienced. And, and I just want to push on you today. I want to press on you today. Is that okay? I think sometimes in our faith, we don't want to be inconvenienced. Sometimes I think in our relationship with God, yo, we treat him like a PSL, a pumpkin spice latte. You just hold on to him and he's all warm and kind and gracious and you got these vibes going on and you don't want to share. This is such goodness that you don't want anybody else to interrupt it. You don't want to be inconvenienced. I've met people like, Pastor Brad, give me a good word today. But whatever you do, don't talk about sin. Don't talk about tithing. Don't talk about money or politics, <laughs> even though it could change your life. I have people who are like, I, I want to have a really good coffee experience when I come to church, but I don't want to be part of the hope team that gets here at 6.45 a.m. to make your, your latte. <laughs> I, I want to be part of a church that makes a difference in the community but, but I don't, I don't want to sign up for Hope Week because I don't want to get poison ivy on this unblemished skin. <laughs> I want to be part of a church that invites unchurched first church people into church. But you know when you pass those invite cards on the way out, you're like, I'm not going to take that today because if I handed them a card, what would happen if they said no? What would happen if they said no? See, I think sometimes in our faith, we like a personal we like a private. We don't want to be inconvenienced. But I am convinced deep in my soul, which is why I'm giving you this message today, that your faith should cause you inconvenience. Your faith should be disruptive. Your faith should make you uncomfortable. How do I know that? Because in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, go and make disciples in all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey my commands. And guess what? I will be with you till the end of the age. 
Can I tell you, church, making disciples is inconvenient. Making disciples is inconvenient. How do I know that? Because he said, go into all the nations, meaning the people you don't like, the people you don't agree with politically, the people who keep putting stupid stuff on social. They're all the nations, by the way. Every tribe, every tongue, every background, no matter where you are, God teaches us to love our enemy and to make disciples. It's inconvenient. It's inconvenient. And I just wonder in this moment if God is asking us not to be concerned about how we feed our faith, but how we feed others' faith. That we would inconvenience our lives. Can I tell you why this matters, church? Can I tell you why this matters? I'm going to tell you anyway. Because how many of you know that our all-powerful, almighty, all concerned with your probs and your feels inconvenienced himself because of your struggle. He inconvenienced himself because of your fight. He inconvenienced himself because of your sin. How many of you know that God inconvenienced himself and he pulled you out of the pit? He inconvenienced himself and he lifted you up. He inconvenienced himself and he showed you the path forward. Inconvenienced himself to the point that he left his throne on the heavens above and sent his son into the throes and to the woes and to the temptations of your life. And he put it in his hands. He tied it to the cross and he put it to death. And then he came back to life and said, church, I'm taking you with me. Church, I'm taking you with me. I'm taking you with me and if God will give his life for you then who are you taking with you <laughs> who are you taking with you this is a good question no you can't take everybody you don't got time for everybody <laughs> which leads to my next point how <laughs> thank you for that I appreciate you so much how do you know who to take with you how do you know who to take with you? I want to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 23. And I find it interesting that we are entering the last few days of David's life. And in David's life, there's not advice, but there's a list. There's a list of people. And we run across this fascinating story that helps us understand who you should take with you. Verse 14, let's, let's go back at it. It says this. At the time David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at. Church, when I, when I do this, I know everybody online and in Ironton gets this, but when I do this, that means you speak. <laughs> okay. He said, he, let me go back to it. At the time David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem, David longed for water and said, Oh my goodness, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. So three SF dudes, special forces dudes, broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. Can I tell you, church, I am frustrated by this story. You ever get frustrated reading God's word? No honest people in the house. You know you've been frustrated with reading God's word. There's some stories that don't make sense. Sometimes things don't make sense in scripture, and I get frustrated. And what God has been teaching me is it's in your greatest frustration that God is making his greatest point. And this is my frustration, church. Yo, what's with Bethlehem? Why Bethlehem? Three times in the scripture he says it. Why Bethlehem? Like, couldn't, couldn't they just found a river? Like, couldn't they have just gone to a lake? Like, like the Bible says they're in a cave. Surely there's like a stalagmite or a stalactite that's dripping water. I don't know which one because it's been forever since I've been in. I don't even know what class it is. But surely there was some moisture on one of those things that could give them a cup of water. And the worst part is he comes back, he comes back, they come back, they give him this water, and David, David 
pours it out for all the homies who almost didn't make it. And if I'm those guys, how many of you know, David, like, this is not a smart move, David. These dudes could kick your face off. If I'm those guys and I watched him pour out, I am kicking that cup out of his hand. I'm like, you're a jerk, dude. <laughs> That's just me. This is why I don't write the Bible. <laughs> but I need you to see this church that it says that he needs a drink, but I want you to know, many of you know that you could survive two to three months without food. But how many of you know that you could only survive about three days without water? And you got to use your biblical imagination in this text because maybe in this moment what the Bible is trying to tell us is not just that David is dehydrated, but maybe David has gone so long without a drink that he's at the point of dying. And these three warriors know that God's got a purpose for David's life. David was meant to become king. And they realize no drink no king. No drink. No king. And these guys were willing to die. Willing to die. Not for their purpose, but for David's purpose. Church, this is good. These men died for somebody else's purpose. And I'm like, Pastor Brad, I know where you're going in this moment. No, you don't. <laughs> No, you don't. Because the word God has been giving me, the word God has been speaking to me is that people are dying for purpose. You, you want to know who you need to take with you in life? It's the people that are dying for purpose. Church, they're all around you. They're all around you. I know some of you might think that I just stay here at Be Hope Church the entire week. I sleep here. I live here. I shower here. I drink here. I eat here. I never leave this place because I got to be holy. <laughs> But I'm not at all. Like, I get to hang out with people all the time. And every week, I get my hair cut. Every week. I don't know why it's an addiction. It just is. And one week, I'm getting my hair cut by my barber. And she, her friend, who also was a barber, was in this suite. And, and she had finished a haircut. And she has all these tattoos on her arm. And I just I started asking about these tattoos. Like, I really like your tattoos. Tell me the story behind them. And as she's talking about these tattoos, she starts telling me about how she wants to be, she wants to own a coffee shop. And she wants to own a tattoo parlor. And she wants to do this venture. And she wants to do this thing and that thing and the next thing. And I just asked her, I said, I just have one question. That all sounds like fun. It's going to take you 50 years to do all that stuff. But help me understand, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do those things? You know what she said? She thought about it for three minutes, looking around like, I don't know how to answer this question. And then she looked at me and she said, I think because it's cool, because it's fun. And I just asked her, I said, what happens when your job is no longer fun? How many of you know you love your job, but if you've been in, in it long enough, you know there are moments you absolutely hate it. You absolutely can't stand it. You have those days on Monday, you're like, I'm ready to quit. And so I asked her this question. I said, no, 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 I'm asking you, what would you give your life to regardless of the job that you had? Which is the question I'm asking you in this moment. What would you give your life to regardless of where you are, the kids that you have, the, the career that you have? What would you give your life to every single day? I asked her this question. And she thought about it. And she said, I don't know why I'm here. And I looked at her and I said, do you want to know how to get there? And she said, I don't know what you're about to do, but whatever it is, I just, I just want to know what my purpose is. She was dying for purpose, but she was begging me to take her with me. And you're like, how do I know people who are dying for God's purpose? How do I know the people who are dying for purpose? Church, they are easy to spot. <laughs> because the Bible says that David was, was thirsty. He needed a drink. And I find it funny that contextually speaking, the way they use thirsty in the Bible is the way we use thirsty today. Thirst trap. <laughs> craving. You got a craving. I don't know about you, but sometimes I crave little Debbie's. What do you crave? Crave Costco pickles. Crave their cookies, pizza. I don't know. What do you crave? 
all I know, wine ins, some of you say wine ins. All I know is that people crave purpose. And the people who don't have purpose will crave things that give them the most attention, but the least amount of satisfaction. You know these people. They want all the attention. Like they put up that questionable post because they think their worth is tied to a number of views. It's the people in your life who keep buying the brand because they think a brand makes them lovable, right? Like it's the person, it's the person who, who gets the promotion the promotion, not because they want the paycheck, but because they have to prove everybody wrong in their lives that they can actually make it. And what we find about these people is that they, they will often give their things to, to the world. They will give their life to things that don't matter. They will give their life to things that bring them happiness, but not the joy that comes from the Lord that becomes their strength. How many of you have people who are holding on to all the wrong things? And God gives us a vision for how we solve people's purpose problems. What do you, what do you mean, Pastor Brad? Remember back to this question I asked you, why Bethlehem? Why Bethlehem? Why would David send these men to Bethlehem? Because he knew that it was, it was a vision for your life. He knew that it was a prophetic picture to how we live in relationship to other people. David knew that this was the framework for how you live. Because how many of you know that in Bethlehem, that was not just the city of David, but that's where Jesus was born. The same Jesus who said, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. The same Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way that you can experience life in its fullness is to give your life to me. It was the same Jesus who told a Samaritan woman, he said, listen, I've got a drink, a drink that you know nothing about. But if you simply ask me for a cup of this water, it's a water that doesn't run dry. It's a water that keeps flowing. It's a water that gives you thirst. It doesn't give you thirst, but it satisfies your thirst in the desert. It's the kind of water in your life that gives you eternal life. This is what Jesus offers to people who are thirsty. And I'm convinced with all my soul these men go to Bethlehem to show us that without God, without Jesus, people will always be thirsty. Without Jesus in our lives, you keep searching, you keep questioning, you keep struggling, you keep fighting, you keep looking, you keep questioning, God, why do you have me here? Without God in our lives, without Jesus, you'll be dying for purpose. And I just want to pause in this moment and say, listen, today may be the day for you to quit living without a purpose and to step into everything that God has for your life because what God has for you is a plan that you can't even dream of, a plan that you can't even imagine, a plan that is beyond your own ability and thought process if you just simply give your life to him. And I just got to say in this moment, some of you are like, Pastor Brad, what about me? I have been church all my life. What do I do? <laughs> what do I do? Can I just pour this vision on your life? What if you became the three men? What, what if maybe the thing that God is asking you to do is to inconvenience your life? That you would break into enemy lines that you would stand up against the evil one, that you would do anything that you could possibly do to take somebody with you so that they could stand at the feet of Jesus and get the first drink of their life that they so deserve. What if that's what God has for your life? To take him with you. Take him with you. Church, some of the questions that I wrestle with are this. Pastor Brother, it's great. I know, how, I know I'm supposed to take people with me. I know I'm supposed to take them with me. How do we do that? How do we do that? And why would we do that? And if you go back to the story that we read earlier, I want to introduce you to these three men <laughs> that David gives us. 
Because they will show you, they will show you what you do with people that you take with you. Uh, let, me, let me just say it like this. When we get to the end of David's life, it's not the advice that matters. It's his list. It's his list. And I want you to see the three lives of these men and watch what they did. It says this. These are the three names of David's mighty warriors. Joshua, Beshebabeth, a Tehemanite. <laughs> you say that was a chief of the three, and he raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed, not in 800 encounters, but in one encounter. Yo, that's amazing. One encounter, 800 men. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Ahoite, and as one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pasdaman for the battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. Church, can I tell you, it really didn't freeze to the sword. This dude is dehydrated. He needs some electrolytes. He is cramping on the sword. He cannot let go of this thing. Then it says this, next to him was Shema, son of Agi the Herorite. And when the Philistines banded together at the place where there was a field of lentils, Israel's troops fled for them, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it, struck down the Philistines, and the Lord gave him a great victory. Gave him a great victory. Did you notice the thread between these three men? Did you see the thread? That in each case, in each case, everybody fled and they were standing there by themselves. When everybody was retreating, when all the other soldiers didn't want to be inconvenienced, these men stood there and fought the battle of the Lord on their own. They were courageous, they had wisdom, and they did it until God provided. And what we see in the lives of these three men is that they were champions. Come on, church. If you can fight off 800 people in one encounter, you are a champ. These dudes were champions, which begs the question, how did they become champions? I'm so glad you asked this. I'm so glad you asked. Because the Bible tells us that David was in a stronghold. And how many of you know that a stronghold is meant for your protection, but it can also become the thing that, that imprisons you? That the thing that was meant to give you safety can quickly become the thing that enslaves you. Here's what I mean by this, church. He is in the cave to receive safety from the Philistines. But church, he was in the cave of Adullam for seven long years. Seven years of darkness in his life. How many of you know David in this moment could have given up? Could have said, I'm going to die here. It's not worth living anymore. I'm depressed. This is hard. I know I'm supposed to be king, but I'm just going to give up. Easily could have done that because of the difficulty that he faced. But what I love in this story is that in his seven years of darkness, David didn't waste time. In these seven years, he took these three men with him took them with them and he taught them how to have a heart after God in such a way that they would make the name of God known he taught them in such a way that they would commit their life to the Lord trust in him believing that God would provide them victory in unconventional ways he taught them how to stand in the face of giants when everybody else was running away everybody else was giving up. He taught them to be champions. And I just want you to see the point of David's life is that David is a leader of leaders. David is a champion of champions. And maybe this is the call that God is putting on your life. I told you, not the most inspiring message, but the most important message. That the call of your life is to be a champion 
to be a champion. Sometimes at Be Hope, we try to dumb down the language. Not dumb down, but not, we don't, we don't use churchy language. And so we use words like, be a champion. And you're like, Pastor Brad, I don't, I don't know what that means. I'm going to tell you right now. Jesus said, go and make, I got five people with me. Jesus said, go and make, I'm going to say it one more time because I don't think you get it. He said, if you want to be a champion, go and make disciples. Make disciples. You, you want to be a champion in your faith? You want to raise your level of faith? You want to be a leader for God? Make disciples. Be a champion. And, and I need you to see the distinction between the two. Because sometimes we confuse discipleship with making disciples. There's a big difference. See, discipleship is when you become more like Jesus. It's when you read God's word. It's when you pray. It's when you come to church. But, but discipleship is about your faith. It's about you becoming like Jesus. That's discipleship. Making disciples is when you help others become like Jesus. And this is the great commission that God has given us. It doesn't say this is Brad's commission or the pastor's commission or, 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 or the staff's commission. No, no, he says it is everybody, la di da the church's great commission to make disciples and be a champion. Can I... Can I show you the picture that God was giving me? Can I show you why this matters for your life? Can I get five volunteers? Five volunteers. Come on up. Let's go down. Let's go. Come on up. Come on up. Let's go. Five people. Let's go. Make it quick. I'm running out of time. Yeah, even if there's 10, I really don't care. <laughs> this is good stuff. I'm going to show you what God has been showing me in this text. All right. One, two, three, four. Make it a sprint. <laughs> this is good. I want to, who wants to be, who wants to be the leader? Who wants to be, all right, Dom, come on up here. By the way, he, Dominic serves with all of our students. He leads them on the week. Can we celebrate the fact that he serves on our student hope team? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He meets with our students. He meets with small groups. He's teaching them, leading them, coaching them. Can I say this? He is making disciples, right? And, and I'm, I'm just guessing that the majority of this crew has been impacted by his ministry in some way, Right? Like, guys, has he made a difference in your life? Yeah. Cool. Do me a favor. Come all the way up here. No, no, stand right here in the center like you're going to fall in the baptismal. Y'all come up around him. I'm convinced that as he invests his life, come around him, put your hands on him, get comfortable with him because he's really changed your life, guys. He's made a difference. I want you to see that if he just gives one year to one person, six months to one person, and then they go out and grab five people, and those five people come behind them. This is the picture that God has been giving me. Is that there is a crew. There is a, there is a crowd. Church, can I tell you, let's go old school. There is a posse. There is a list of people standing behind him. It is a cloud of witnesses when he stands before God on judgment day. Can I show you, in David's life, when he showed up, it wasn't about his advice in his last words. It was about his list. It was about his list. And I'm convinced that when you stand before God on judgment day, he's not going to judge you based upon your good behavior. He's not going to judge you based upon whether you had good theology and had lots of knowledge. He's going to look at you and ask you about your list. And I don't know about you, but I want to be surprised at the number of people who are standing behind me because I discipled them and gave my life to them. I want you to be surprised by the number of people standing behind you when you stand before God. Because how many of you know in the presence of God, you don't feel worthy? You're going to be humbled and you're going to be on your knees thinking, I don't deserve to make it to heaven. But you got a list. You got a cloud of witnesses behind you to say, no, Lord, you don't understand. When I was in trouble, this man helped me. When I was in need of understanding how to spiritually grow, he showed me God's word. When I was hurting in pain, he met me in the middle of my need. 
when I was sick, when I was in prison, when I wasn't sure where to go. He showed up and just made me aware of the presence of God. And in that moment, as God looks at your list, as he looks at your list, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom of God today. Can we give them a hand? Y'all are great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I don't know about you, but that's why I want to be surprised at the number of people behind me when I stand before God because I'm not worthy to enter his kingdom. But I pray that he would stand before me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want this just to be a message for you. I want this to be a commitment for you. This is your calling in this life for people who are dying without purpose is to make disciples, to be a champion. And I just want to ask in this moment, who's willing to make this their passion? Who's willing to give this life to a legacy of leading other people? Who in this moment is willing to give their life to God and go with him to make a difference in somebody else's life? How many of you know God gave his life for you? How many of you would be willing in this moment to say, I'm taking them with them. I'm going to expand the kingdom. I'm going to take anybody with me at any moment, at any time to show them the power of who Jesus is and what he can do in their life. I need to know, church, who you taking with you? Who you taking with you? How many of you in this moment believe that this is what God has planned for your life is to stand up in faith and acknowledge the best thing you can do is to take somebody with you. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Take them with you, church. Take them with you, church. Take them with you wherever you are in faith. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Give your life to it. Take them with you. Take them with you. I'm going to make it a simple church. I'm going to ask you this one last question. Two things that you can take with you. One question. Who is the one person that God is leading me to in this next year? That if I'm reading his word, I'm going to teach them the word. If I'm learning how to pray, I'm teaching them how to pray. If he's teaching me, I'm just teaching them what he's teaching me. By the way, that's how this works. I'm just teaching you what God's teaching me. Who is the one person this year that you're taking with you? The second question is this. You're like, Pastor Brad, I don't know how to do this. Good news, Be Hope. Be Hope has a process by which we will train you to take people with you. It's called Hope Discovered. And so you can scan the QR code on the back of those chairs and you can get to Hope Discovered that way. But Hope Discovered will train you to be somebody who takes people with you. And that is the calling and the desire that God has for your life. Amen. Take them with you. Would everybody stand with me? If you're not standing, now's the time to stand. This is a good time to do it. As we get ready for baptisms and we get to witness people proclaiming faith, I would invite you into this moment. If God has changed your life in this series, as we get ready to sing this song, you can come forward through baptism, acknowledging what God has done inside of you. Today's the day. Don't hold back. But I would also say, if you're dying for purpose in this life, you don't have, you don't have to keep questioning why you exist, why God has you here. I can assure you from my own personal life that the moment I gave my life to Jesus, it was the day that changed everything. And I found exactly what I was looking for. And I want the same for you that in a relationship with him, you wouldn't be dying for purpose, but you would be dying to sin and alive in Christ, knowing why you exist. And so we're gonna pray this prayer together. We're gonna invite people into the kingdom today. Church, would you help us pray those who are gonna be praying this prayer for the first time? Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, that he gave his life to forgive my sins, and he was raised from the grave so that I may have life. I receive your grace by faith. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate the lives today who are stepping into the kingdom of God for the first time. And if today you want to get baptized, walk on forward as we sing.